Well, good morning. If you would turn in your Bible to the book of Exodus, chapter 18. This morning we're going to be in the entire chapter of 18, uh, verses 1 through 27. Um, <clears throat> title of the sermon this morning is Sharing the Burden of Ministry. Sharing the Burden of Ministry. So let's uh, read the text and uh, open us in a word of prayer, and then we will uh, jump into the uh, sermon this morning. Exodus chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard all of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the hardship that had come upon them in the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, and that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day... Moses sat to judge the people and stood around, uh, and, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father in law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father in law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people will you, with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. And you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make known to them the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter, they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands and hundreds of fifties and tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart and he went away to his own country. Please pray with me. Father, my prayer this morning is uh, what we just sang, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that uh, whatever um, is on your heart this morning, whatever is, is on your mind this morning, that you would make it known to us through this word, um, through your spirit, through each other as we meet in our community groups, as we go forth and eat lunch and, and share life, as we um, 
just share uh, the, out of the overflow of, of whatever is going on in our life, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning, that we may know you better, that we may know your will better, that we may, uh, as a result, um, grow closer to you. So God, please come and speak to us this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Ministry is not for the faint of heart. Every Christian wants Christianity. Everybody, every Christian wants Christianity. Few Christians want ministry. And I don't mean full-time ministry. I don't mean even paid ministry. I mean lay ministry, what you do. Not necessarily just what I do or what other ministers or paid staff do. I mean lay ministry. Ministry is hard work. It's not easy. It never has been easy. It never will be easy. The Apostle Paul, who in many ways set the pattern for us as to what ministry was supposed to look like, even wrote about this and wrestled with this. For, he says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction that we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our own strength that we despaired of life itself. Paul even got burdened by ministry to the point that he despaired of life itself. Even Jesus and his humanity wrestle with this. The disciples find Jesus sleeping during a storm, presumably worn out from ministry. Even when he sits down in a well at Samaria, if you remember, he went to sit down at this well because it said he was wearied from his journey. Even when he sits down to, to take a rest, he still finds himself in ministry to a woman who is broken. Ministry is hard work and often feels like a burden. A joyful burden, but a burden nonetheless. And I think the temptation for any of us, including myself and for you, is to try to carry this burden on our own. Much like if we had a 400-pound barbell in front of us and we need to move it, the thought is, well, you know what? I just need to work out more. I just need to get stronger. And if I get stronger, I'll be able to move the barbell by myself. You know what? The thing, I, I can do this. I can do it. I just need to get stronger. We all face this temptation to try to carry this burden by ourselves. Maybe we do this because we don't want to bother other people. You know, maybe we're like, I don't want to ask him to help me move this barbell. Maybe we do it because we pridefully believe that we can do it. I just, if I just lift enough weights, I can move this barbell. Maybe we look around and we see how weak people are and we think they'll, they'll never be able to do this. Never realizing that if they help us move it, you know what happens? They get stronger too. We both get stronger. We all have a responsibility and more importantly, a privilege to share in the burden of ministry. And this cuts both ways. Both ways, the need to share the burden with others, but also the need to help others share the burden in ministry, to lift the burden from others. This morning, we're going to talk about sharing the burden of ministry. So here's the structure of the sermon this morning, all right? I'm going to begin with three groups of people that we need in the church. At this church, at every church. Three groups of people that we need in the church, and then I'm going to give you five truths from this passage. So let's begin with three groups of people that we need in the church. A, we need Jethro's in the church. And I don't mean Jethro from the Beverly Hillbillies, though it'd be great if we had a billionaire in the church. We could do a lot of ministry work uh, if he was generous. Three groups of people, Number uh, A, letter A, we need Jethro's in the church. I see three traits of Jethro in this passage. Here they are. Number one, he had eyes to see. Look at verse 13 to 14 here in chapter 18. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing, so I want to first point out that Jethro saw what Moses was doing. So much of ministry begins simply by having eyes to see, having our eyes open. 
You know, it's very easy to come to the body of Christ to have our eyes closed, spiritually closed. It's so easy to do that, to just come to church, come to small group, come to prayer group, come to any kind of spiritual gathering, and to have our spiritual eyes closed, right? And there's a danger to this. Here's the danger. Let me kind of give you an illustration, all right? If you were climbing up a ladder to a very tall building, right, you would not want a blind person holding the ladder. Now, that's not to be negative or to put down somebody who's blind. My point is, though, you're climbing up a ladder and you need somebody who's able to see exactly if the ladder is tilting this way or if you're about to fall off the ladder or if you're about to hit an a, a, a electric wire or something. You would hopefully, you know, there's some jobs that you need somebody who can see so that they can give you advice and tell you where you're messing up or where you're making a mistake or you're about to fall off the ladder, Right. So here, here's my point. We need people in the church who are seen, who have eyes to see. Jethro had eyes to see a need in Moses' life. We need people in this church who have their spiritual eyes open. Do we have our spiritual eyes open to see the needs and burdens of others? Listen, having been a minister, I, you know, and talking to a lot of people, I cannot tell you how many people I have talked to before who came to church once or twice at this church and other churches and then left. And then I asked them, you know, why they didn't come or why they came for a few months and then left. I cannot tell you how many times people have told me they said, I felt like nobody saw me. I felt like I came to church and I was just invisible. Do we have our spiritual eyes open to the burden and the needs of others around us? Or are our, our eyes closed? Number two, he had the heart to do something. Look at verse 14. When Moses' father-in-law saw that what he was doing, he said, what is this that you are doing? Right? So Jethro sees with his eyes that Moses is doing something that is not wise, and then he comes and approaches Moses to help him. Now here's my point. How easy would it have been for Jethro to think, huh, Moses is judging all the cases? Great, more time for me. I can catch up on Hebrew law and order, right? Uh, or Moses is gonna take up all the cases? Well, that's not my problem. I'm glad he, I'm glad, I'm glad Moses has the heart to do this. You know, that's great, but uh, nah, it's not my problem. That's not what Jethro does, though. Jethro cares for his son-in-law. He doesn't just have eyes to see that there's a problem. He has the heart to go and do something about it. So the question is, do we not only have eyes to see burdens and needs, but do we have the heart to go and do something about it? And number three, uh, uh, he has the wisdom and foresight to prevent a problem. Look at verse 17 and 18. Jethro says, Moses' father-in-law uh, father said to him, what, are you, what you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for this thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do this alone, Moses. Now, perhaps from being older, perhaps from being a priest in Midian, perhaps just divinely given by God, Jethro has the wisdom and the foresight to see that this is going to be a problem. He looks and he, and he says, look, you're not going to be able to do this, Moses. You will get burnt out. Not only will you get burnt out, Moses, the people will get burnt out. They'll get burnt out because you won't be able to hear all their cases. They're going to get frustrated with you. You cannot do this alone. Jethro has the wisdom and the foresight to see that this is not a good plan. So here's the question. Do we have the wisdom of God? And are we sharing the wisdom of God? Now maybe if you're here this morning and you say, well, you know, I, I never really thought of myself as a wise person, right? I never, you know, I thought of other people as wise, but I never really thought of myself as a wise person or somebody who had a lot of wisdom to offer. Well, if that's true, then are we on our knees, as James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God. Who will give it generously without reproach. We need people in the church who have eyes to see 
have a heart to go and do something about it, and have wisdom that they can offer people. We need these people in our church. B, we need Moseses in the church. I wasn't quite sure how to make Moseses plural, but I, for all you grammar scholars, hopefully that's correct. We need Moseses in the church. Now again, with this, I don't mean we need my three-year-old, more of my three-year-old son, though we'd probably do well with that. Uh, I see three traits of Moses in this passage. Number one, Moses walks closely with God. Look at verse 15 here. And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. The reason that the people came to Moses to get their case heard was because Moses walked intimately with God. A.W. Tozer wrote, everybody is as close to God as he wants to be. Now, when I hear that quote, I, I, there, there's an element that's not true and true about it, okay? The part that's not true is that I will only get as close to God as God ordains me to be, right? Moses had a unique relationship with God because God ordained for him to have this unique relationship. God did not reveal himself to, the, uh, to other people in the way that he did to Moses. So people only, Moses got closer to God because God allowed him to. However, the quote is true, Tozer's quote is true, in that so far as it depends on me, as much as I can control it, don't I want to be as close to God as I possibly can? Don't I want to get as far, as close to God as I possibly can? Now, this is not so that we can boast and be like, oh yeah, yeah, I walk close to God. That, that's not so we can boast in that. This is because, listen, listen to me when I say this, what this church needs most is not our gifting, it's not our intelligence, it's not our education, it's not our ministry techniques, it's not our resources. What this church needs most is for us to be a man or a woman who walks intimately with God. What this church needs most, what the world needs most, is for us to be men and women who walk intimately with God. That is far more important than our resources, our education, our talent, our experience, or anything else that we think we can bring to the table. There is nothing greater that we can do than to walk closely with God. Number two, Moses has discernment. Look at verse 16. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. I make known to them the statutes of God and his laws. Now, Moses didn't go to law school. All right? He, he's serving as a judge. He did not go to law school. What did he do? He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd for 40 years. Now, I don't know how much you learn about being a judge as shepherding sheep. I imagine not very much. So how does he decide between one person and another? How was he qualified to be the sole judge of 600,000 people? I imagine he relied upon God for discernment. Isn't it interesting that the prophet that all of Israel looked to throughout all generations as the standard of all prophets was a shepherd? The king that all of Israel looked to as the standard of all kings was a shepherd? The king himself, the king of kings, was a carpenter, and his followers were fishermen. Now, what's my point? I don't care if you are a computer programmer, if you are a teacher, if you are a Subway $5 footlong maker. You have something to offer this church. Don't limit God's ability to work through you. Doesn't matter if you have a low view of yourself. Have a high view of God. It matters not what you think about yourself. What matters is what do you think about God? Number three. Moses is a teacher. Verse 16. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another and I make known to them, 
I make them know the statutes of God and his law. Now, Moses' job was to teach the people God's laws and his statutes. Now, I understand not everybody is called to be a teacher. In fact, James says not many of you should presume to be teachers. Why? Because teachers will be judged with greater strictness. You want to teach the word? Fine. But just know going into it, you will be judged with greater strictness. So I, I get that. However, just as Moses was commanded by God to teach his people the laws and the rules and the statutes, we have all, let me say that again, we have all, all, all been given a mandate, a commission by the Lord Jesus Christ. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching teaching, teaching, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Yes, we're not all teachers in the office sense of the word, but every last Christian is a teacher. This commission given by Jesus, he doesn't just give it to the elders. He doesn't just give it to the disciples. He's not just giving it to pastors. He's not just giving it to those who've been saved for 10 years. He's not just giving it to those who wear Jesus shirts or those who carry big Bibles. He's not just giving it to the mature in the church. He's giving it to every last Christian in the history of the world. This commission is for every single Christian. Jesus has just made you a disciple maker and a teacher right now will you go and obey this we need people who walk closely with god we need people who have discernment and we need people who will go and teach people how to obey christ see we need able men and women in the church now, just as a side note, I put women in parentheses here because, the, because we don't just need able men in the church. We need able women as well, all right? This sermon today is not the time nor the place to discuss the role of women in ministry or gender-based distinctions in ministry. That's, that's another sermon for another day, okay? Uh, uh, here in the context in Old Testament Judaism, uh, only men were selected to this task. So I'm going to stay within the context here, okay? Just... For now, don't, but don't hear me say that we don't need able women in the church. We desperately need able women in the church, all right? So look at verse 21. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. There are three traits that are listed here for these men. Number one, they are men who fear God. Number two, they are men who are trustworthy. And three, they are men who hate a bribe. Now, these men will serve as judges for the people. Just as we have under shepherds in the church, these men are going to be a, kind of like an under judge. Moses is like the Supreme Court judge, and these will be under judges, if you will, who will judge the small matters in their cases. And Jethro says the first thing they need to be is men who fear God. Why? Because they need to fear God more than man. Anytime you're dealing with people, the temptation is to please man. The temptation is to play to the praise of man. I know that this person wants me to do this. I know that this would make this person happy. I want them to like me. I want them to praise me. I want them to be on my side. So the temptation is to play to that. These men need to be men who fear God more than man. These men need to be men who are willing to please, who strive to please God more than pleasing man. Number two, they need to be trustworthy. They need to be men who will do the right thing not show partiality, not show favoritism. Anytime you're dealing with people's livelihoods, you need men who will seek truth and pursue truth. Not play politics, not play favorites. And number three, they need to be men who won't be swayed by money. You know, we've seen enough political, like in cr TV crime shows, you know, knowing that anytime you deal with the judicial system or politics, there's corruption. Right? There's, and the reason is, is that there's a temptation to provide money or benefits or kickbacks to people so that you get the judgment that you want. 
Doesn't, that goes on in America, goes on in China, goes on all across the world. These men need to be men who will not be swayed by money. Not only will they not be swayed, the text says they need to be men who hate, hate a bribe. They hate it. They hate the, the idea of being corrupted. Now, I want to point out one side note before we move on. I want to point out what they don't need to be. They don't have to have a PhD. They don't have to have a master's. In fact, education is not mentioned at all. They don't need to be 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, 40 years old. In fact, age is not mentioned at all. Experience is not mentioned at all. Talent is not mentioned at all. Socioeconomic status is not mentioned at all. What family they come from is not mentioned at all. It's not that those things aren't important, but it is to say that all three traits that are listed for these men to be judges of the people all deal with the same topic, character. They need to be men of character. Listen to me. You don't have to be rich educated, talented, from a great family, have a lot of training to be a man or woman of character. You don't have to be anything to be a man or woman of character. We need men and women of character in the church. Those are the three groups of people that we need in the church. The five truths from this passage. Number one, Humbly give counsel when counsel is needed. Humbly give counsel when counsel is needed. I can't tell you how many mistakes in my life have been averted by people giving me counsel. And both ways, where I was going to go do something, and I, I had my mind set, this is what I was supposed to do, and somebody gave me counsel and said, uh, you might want to think about that for a moment. I'm not sure that that's what you should do. And it saved me from making a big mistake. Or, I was not going to do something. I don't want to do that. I, no, I'm not going to do that. And somebody said, you should consider doing that. And this wasn't always by people who were my elders. This wasn't always by a man with gray hair or a woman with gray hair. Many times, if not a majority of the time, this was from my peers. I know that so often we think like we can't give counsel to one another because we're like, well, I'm not old. I'm not, I'm not 60 years old, you know, and i got to wait till I give that. No. Peers can give counsel to peers. So here's my point. If you have counsel to give, give it. Jethro looked at what Moses was doing and he recognized that this was not a good plan. Now notice this counsel comes from Jethro, not God. Now I understand ultimately it was empowered by God and he only gave it by the power of God. But I do want to point out that Jethro is the one who gives this counsel to Moses, not God. I wonder like how long would God have allowed Moses to keep doing this before somebody said something? How burnt out would God have let Moses get? Have we ever considered that maybe the reason sometimes God is silent and just lets us keep making mistakes is because he's waiting for us to speak? Have we ever considered that maybe the reason God doesn't come to us and it doesn't speak to us, is that he's waiting for his children to speak to one another. The beautiful thing about the body of Christ is that we all have the Spirit of God. If you are a Christian, you have the Spirit of God living inside of you. And yes, some people have a greater measure of the fullness of the Spirit, which means they have maybe more wisdom and more understanding and more discernment. But every Christian has the Spirit of Christ. And because every spirit, Christian has the Spirit of Christ, it means every single Christian has counsel to offer. If you are a Christian, you have counsel to offer one another. 
When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. I believe that Jethro's counsel changed Moses' life. People have given me counsel before that, have cha- that has changed my life. Off of one thing they said to me, it changed my life. Perhaps you too have a word of encouragement, challenge, rebuke, hope, advice, counsel, that if you would share that with somebody else, would change their life. I pray you would care enough to go and share it. It's not presumptuous to give counsel. Let's all share in the task of ministry and humbly, humbly give counsel where counsel is needed. Number two, humbly listen to counsel when counsel is given. You knew I was going there. When Jethro gave his counsel to Moses, I can think of several reasons why Moses might be tempted to not listen to this counsel. I mean, if I'm Moses and I'm the sole judge, I can think of several reasons why I might not want to do this. Uh, Maybe he thought he was the only one capable of doing this job. Uh, None of them have been to seminary. They can't do this. Maybe he thought they're too weak or inexperienced. Oh, no. Y'all are sinners. Y'all can't do this. Maybe he didn't want to relinquish his power. You know, he's like, man, if I'm the sole judge, like I'm, I'm executioner, judge, ruler, jury, like I, I don't want to give away my power. We don't want a three-branch system of the judicial system here. No checks and balances here. Maybe he didn't want to share his influence, right? If I'm the sole judge, you know what? People think well of me. Like, man, Moses, man, he, you got to go to Moses. Yeah, you got to go to Moses. Maybe he likes the praise of being the sole judge. Maybe he doesn't trust the people. I can think of a hundred different reasons why Moses might not want to listen to this counsel. But by the grace of God, he doesn't fall sway to any of those reasons. By the grace of God, look at verse 24. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law. How many times in Scripture do we read where somebody is given counsel and they just disregard it? They just go and do what they want to do. Joab tells David, David, don't take a census. And David says, whatever, I'm taking a census. Solomon's advisors tell his son, Rehoboam, don't don't do this. He says, whatever, I'm going to do it. How many times in Scripture was counsel given and the person just totally disregarded it? Listening to counsel is one of the most effective and beneficial things that we can do in the Christian walk, but it's often one of the most difficult especially when the council goes against our nature, especially when the council is telling us to do something that we don't want to do. You ever had somebody tell you, like, give you counsel, and you're like, inside, you're like, I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't want to do that. Scripture is clear that the wise man listens to counsel. The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. And my favorite, Ecclesiastes, better was a poor and wise youth than an old and full king who no longer knew how to take advice. It'd be better to be 15 years old and have no money, no status, and have the ability to listen to advice than to be 85 years old and no longer know how to take advice. When it comes to ministry, this counsel may come from both sides. Maybe somebody is counseling us to engage in ministry. Maybe somebody has come to you and says, I think you should consider this. You should consider this life path or doing this or to help others share the burden. Maybe somebody's challenging us to read our Bible or to pray or to share the gospel or to take up a ministry. I pray that we would humbly listen to the counsel when counsel is given. Maybe somebody's challenging us like Jethro is to Moses that we're doing too much, that we need to seek help, that we need to delegate, that we need to get focused or let others share in this burden. I pray that we would humbly listen to counsel 
when counsel is given. Now listen, I'm not saying you need to obey every piece of counsel. In fact, you should not obey every piece of counsel you're given. But I pray that we would humbly at least listen to it and prayerfully consider every piece of counsel that is given to us. Number three, ministry is difficult and time-consuming. I titled the sermon this morning, Sharing the Burden of Ministry. And one word kind of stands out in that title, right? Burden. You know, it's kind of, especially coming from a pastor, like it seems funny to call it a burden. Like I was like, Matt, how would you describe being a pastor at CSBC? Burden. Seems funny to call it that, right? Like it makes it seem like work and toil. It is. Ministry is work and toil, not just for me, but for you. 24 times in his letters, Paul refers to his ministry and the ministry of others as labor, as toil. Ministry is difficult and time-consuming. One of the best examples that I can think of of this um, is in the Gospels. When Jesus heard uh, that John had been beheaded, John's his cousin, now here is John that Jesus said, uh, this man has given his life to prepare the way for him. He's done nothing except live his life for the glory of the Messiah. And John just got brutally beheaded. And the text says when Jesus heard about this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. I imagine he needed some time to himself. If you just found out that a family member who had devoted their life to making much of you had just been beheaded, wouldn't you need some time to yourself? Jesus gets into a boat to go be by himself. When he gets to the other side, when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Now this is why I would make a terrible savior. <laughs> Because you know what I would have done? Oh, I, I forgot my wallet. I rode back to the other side. I think that if I was grieving, if I was emotionally spent, the last thing I would have wanted is to be around people. And I know you introverts are the same way. And this is why I love Jesus. Why I'm so challenged by Jesus, because you know what Jesus does? He had compassion on them. And he healed their sick. How easy it would have been for Jesus to say, I need somebody to help me. I need, I, my, 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 my cousin that I love just got beheaded. I need somebody to help me. The, you guys should be coming, I should be coming to you for help, and yet they're coming to Jesus to be helped by him. What an unbelievable Savior. That he takes the time. Ministry is hard work and time-consuming. If somebody told me that ministry was not hard, and it was just a joyful delight at all times, I'd seriously question if they were doing any real ministry. I take the word burden straight out of our text this morning. Look at verse 22. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. Not only was it a burden, but it was a time-consuming burden. Look at verse 13 here. In verse 13, it says, The next day Moses had to judge them. They stood around Moses from morning till evening. Can you imagine having to judge people from morning till evening? And then even when he shares this burden with the people, look at verse 22. It says, They shall judge them at all times. Verse 26, They shall judge them at all times. There's no cookie cutter approach to ministry. There's no express checkout line for sanctification. We are never going to develop an app for holiness and godliness, ever. Moses is going to be with these people for 40 years, shepherding them. He just began. Listen to me when I say this. If you love Jesus, 
you will never retire from ministry, ever. You won't. We will be doing this till the day we die. But here's the best news. Here's the best news. We're in it together. We're sharing it together. We're not doing it alone. We must not do it alone. Point number four, ministry is meant to be shared. Look at verse 14. Jethro says to him, uh, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? And then in verse 18, he says, you can't do this alone, Moses. Jethro, who is not God's prophet, understands enough to know this task must be shared. I assure us that if Moses couldn't do this alone, couldn't do ministry alone, you and I can't either. Ministry is meant to be shared. And so Moses shares it. Look at verse 25. Moses chose able men out of all of Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. And so Moses gets this. He, he, he understands that ministry is it's meant to be shared. And this counsel proves to be invaluable to Moses. Why? Because this is going to continue. This is going to continue to be a problem. Later in the desert experience, God comes to Moses in Numbers and says to him, Gather for me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of the meeting, and let them take their stand with you. And I will come down and I will talk with you there. Then I will take some of the spirit that is on you and I will put it on them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to bear it by yourself, Moses. Now Moses had already learned this lesson of sharing ministry, but there were others in Israel who had not learned it yet. Some of the others had a problem with this. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. I like their names, Eldad and Medad. And the spirit rested on them. They were among those who registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. So they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, said to the, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. And notice that. Stop prophesying. And Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Are you worried that, like, I'm going to lose my title of the greatest prophet of all time? Would that all the Lord's were, people were prophets? Would that the Lord would put His Spirit on all of them? I'm not going to stop Eldad and Medad. I want you to be Eldad and Medad. I want you to prophesy like they are. Would that everybody had the Spirit of the Lord upon them? Guess what? This has finally come true. As New Testament Christians, the same spirit that God put upon Moses has now put upon us. We all share the burden of ministry. As a pastor, I may have a unique role to fulfill in this church, but that doesn't make me necessarily any more important or effective than you. Tim Keller is not more effective than you. Francis Chan is not more effective than you. You have the Spirit like they do. You have the ability to change someone's life like any Christian does. Paul wrote, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. You have the Spirit of God. You have the ability to prophesy. No different than Moses. My hope is that every lost person that steps into this church would become saved. And every saved person 
who is a regular attender would become a member. And every member would become a serving member. And every serving member would make their life count by sharing the burden of ministry. Do you want to make your life count? It's not by being a Christian. Being a Christian does not make your life count. Taking up ministry does. Living for the kingdom does. Sharing the burden of ministry does. That's how you make your life count. That's how you will stand on the final day and not hear you wasted your life. But rather, well done, good and faithful servant. Last point, number five. Sharing the burden is a win-win. Look at verse 23. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all the people also will go to their place in peace. Sharing the burden of ministry is surely a win-win. Why? Number one, Moses will be able to endure. Remember, Moses has 40 years to go. He's not going to make it at the pace that he's going at. If Moses tries to be the sole judge, he's going to get burnt out, probably after a few months, maybe a few years. He's going to get burnt out. But if he shares the burden, he will be able to endure the 40 years. When? Number two, also the people will go home in peace. Why? Because they got their case heard. The United States government could probably take a lesson from this. How many times is there a situation or a plea or an argument or a case that we simply cannot get heard because there's not enough help? There's not enough workers. There's not enough case workers or social workers or judges or whatever the case may be. Well, there's 600,000 people in the desert. I kind of imagine them standing in a line like at the DMV with one window, Moses standing behind it. And Moses is like number 323,472. 323,472. 